and we are recording. And I'm delighted to have with me today a um, friend of the podcast, Amber O'Hearn, who is a science writer, programmer, and since 2009, a radical carnivore. And Dr. Ted Naiman, who's a medical doctor specializing in diet and exercise, who coined the term PE diet, which stands for the protein to energy ratio diet. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us. So I asked you both on together because there's um, a couple of persistent points that come up online, particularly on Twitter, um, discussions that you both get involved in and more widely that appear constantly on Facebook groups and elsewhere online um, talking about subjects like fat, protein, satiety, uh, weight loss, weight gain around nutrition and um, exercise. Calories in, calories out is, is, is uh, obviously one of the more uh, better known phrases around it. And you have areas of disagreement that seem to come up again and again. So I thought it'd be great to, uh, to get you both on to talk about it at, at, at a bit of length. And just to sort of um, burst the bubble that this is going to be some kind of head-to-head uh, -head debate, um, I'll just I'll read what you each said when you got back to me about, about coming on. And Ted, you said that I'm not really interested in any kind of formal debate. Um, I don't really disagree that some people have higher satiety with stricter ketosis and higher fat and lower protein diets and even zero carbohydrate diets. Um, you said, I do think that everyone is different and there's plenty of room for experimentation. And that I also believe that there is a ceiling to how much satiety protein actually provides. And over a certain point, more protein is not helpful. And I'm guessing that Amber would agree with this. And then Amber, you said, to be sure, I'm not interested in any kind of adversarial situation or trying to prove each other wrong. Uh, I agree with Ted that we agree, at least in principle, on most of the fundamentals, although I think there is nuance within that. For example, we might disagree on the prevalence of certain responses or some mechanisms at play. So on that footing, um, let's, let's kick it off. Um, something that comes up again and again is why some people who can't lose weight with high protein can with lower protein and higher fat. Um, you know, there's usually a back and forth about protein, satiety, calories in, calories out, and so on. And we'll get to those subjects in, in due course. Um, but I think a lot of it can be um, summed up by something you wrote, Amber, which is that energy out is not an independent variable. So perhaps you could unpack that statement and then Ted could maybe respond in turn. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think if, if there were no other controlling factors at play, then certainly the amount of fat that you ate should be the determining factor for how much fat is going to be released because you have a certain amount of energy that you're like by that supposition you have a certain amount of energy that you're going to release and it has to come from somewhere and if you if you intercede by taking in dietary fat then that's just going to strictly replace the fat that you release but because there are hormonal effects that come into play based on what you eat and because different um, conditions and contexts can also affect those hormonal responses, then I don't think it's it's straightforward at all to say that eating more fat is necessarily going to correspond to less release because there could be a, a hormonal situation where um, having less protein and more fat could actually increase your involuntary energy out through certain mechanisms. So that's what I was basically getting at by that statement. Thanks. Yeah, Ted, what do you what do you think about that? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Energy in and energy out are completely dependent. I mean, they're neither of these are independent. They're very, very dependent. And, you know, for example, if you if you underfeed someone, their basal metabolic rate is going to drop 
uh, more than expected, their physical activity level might go down um, significantly. That so you're you're going to see um, both overfeeding and underfeeding um, uh, generate responses in energy expenditure. Also, the same thing with energy expenditure. If you have someone who uh, increases their physical activity level, you'll see um, intakes go up. Um, usually, people do a better job of matching intake to expenditure at higher energy flux and higher G, higher energy expenditure. But um, yeah, so they're completely dependent and you'll also uh, be more or less successful at maintaining body mass and body fatness at different energy fluxes, high versus low. Um, so it's like super complicated and all <laughs> interconnected. And yeah, I totally agree. They're not independent whatsoever. It's not as simple as just saying eat less and then you're gonna, you know, be thinner. That's it just, it totally doesn't work. I'm really interested in that. I've never heard um, that statement that at higher flux, there tends to be better matching. Um, maybe you could elaborate or? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a fascinating, um, <clears throat> fascinating um, uh, study. Basically, if you look at uh, someone who's fairly sedentary, let's say, let's say you're, you have a basal metabolic rate and then you do enough movement and exercise to uh, have your total energy expenditure be like 1.4 times your basal metabolic rate. That's a fairly sedentary person. They're going to have a much higher, harder time matching intake to expenditure. Basically, their energy flux is low. You know, they're only eating 1500 calories and they're only burning 1500 calories and they're only at 1.4 times their BMR. And um, any little increase in their intake, they're not going to match their expenditure and um, the default is for them to kind of get fatter. And so in that stage, if you overfeed someone and then underfeed them by the same amount for the same amount of time, uh, you would expect nothing to change, but the, the, they actually steadily get fatter at that lower energy flux. Uh, on the other hand, if you um, make someone exercise more to the point that they're, you know, doing, let's say you're doing an extra hour of exercise and now your total energy expenditure is 1.8 times your basal metabolic rate, you're going to see much, much better matching of intake to expenditure. Everyone's worried that, oh, if I exercise more, I'll just get hungry and eat more. And that's absolutely true, but you get better and better and better at matching intake to expenditure and maintaining body weight at a higher energy flux. And, and it, it turns out that your body actually wants a really high energy flux. Your, your body doesn't want your intakes and expenditures to be low. It wants you to eat a ton of calories and burn a ton of calories. And there's two ways to burn a ton of calories. One is just being fatter, just having a larger body size. You're gonna burn more calories just sitting on the couch. The other one is doing way more exercise. And so your body keeps trying to go back to this high energy flux. And in fact, that it, it really explains every single bit of weight regain after weight loss. So let's say right now you're eating 3000 calories a day and you're burning 3000 calories a day, even though you're sedentary, just cause you're like super fat and your body size is huge. Um, and now you just force yourself to eat 2000 calories a day and you will go down and burn only 2000 calories a day. And a lot of that is because you lose all this body mass and your basal metabolic rate goes way down. Well, it's very hard to stay there because your body wants to go back to the high energy state. And there's two ways to do that. One is to just eat more and then exercise more. So you just increase your exercise energy expenditure. The other one is to just slowly regain your weight and get right back up to the same weight you were before. And that's why weight loss is all about diet, but weight loss maintenance is all about exercise. You have to intentionally do enough exercise to have your total energy expenditure be similar to what it was before. So then you can eat more and burn more and stay thinner. It's like, if you look at, you know, um, Dr. Herman Ponser's work and the Hadza and, uh, you know, your, your average American male weighs 200 pounds and eats 3000 calories a day. And then your Hadza male, uh, only weighs, you know, 150, 30 pounds or they're just way thinner, way lighter, way smaller bodies, way lower body fat, but they're not eating that much fewer calories. They're eating like 2,700 calories a day. They're only a couple hundred calories lower, but they're doing like 10 times more exercise, 20,000 steps a day. They're actually physically active, you know, two and a half hours a day. They're just basically a huge volume of exercise. So um, you're much, much more successful at matching intake to expenditure and maintaining um, body weight if your energy expenditure and intake are both high. 
So yeah, you actually, you honestly, you want to be thin on the highest calorie intake you can possibly get, but burning as much energy as possible. And you're going to be way more energy. Magic. It's like, it's like you're flying your calorie plane really high off the ground uh, changes in, you know, anything that comes along is not going to bother you. But if you're flying your calorie plane, like 10 feet off the ground and, a, you know, a little mountain comes along, you're just going to crash. So, um, hi higher, uh, energy intake and expenditure is desirable when it comes to, uh, matching better. That is fascinating. Um, I'm really glad to hear that you agree about the preference to be at the higher energy because to me that's really important and it's not um, necessarily even important from a theoretical standpoint although I do imagine like your body if you have energy a lot of energy to use your body can use it for things that it might be deprioritizing if you don't have enough energy like things like repair but the the main reason that I I personally prefer to have higher energy all else equal is that it just feels great right like, mm -hmm. if yeah. You, if you have all this energy, then you you do things, you you enjoy your life more, in my opinion. But the one thing that stuck out to me when you were talking about that was the the point about intentional exercise. And I'm wondering what you think about the following description of what happened to me. And I've heard it from some other people too. Is that when I started rapidly losing weight when I went from a ketogenic diet to carnivore for whatever reason. I was losing weight and I didn't increase my exercise voluntarily because I had a I had a lot of moving parts in my life young children but what I did notice was that I had this compulsion to use energy even in an exercise way so I used to walk my youngest to preschool and I can remember literally skipping down the road with him because I just had energy to burn so to speak and then like I've, I've never been much of a runner. I've done it a few times in my life, but at that point in my life, I can remember running home just for fun because it felt good. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about involuntary energy expenditure increasing just from eating more. Yeah, and, and if I may, um, my thought that was similar was wondering about the cause and effect, if you like, you know, is it the exercise that drives calorie intake to go up or is it high, high quality calorie intake that drives exercise or is it both or is it something else? And, you know, I'm thinking about the HADs as well and how their calorie expenditure over the long term seems to match uh, with lean mass to sedentary uh, Western Westerners, you know, so is it that, it's um, that they're eating the same amount of calories even though they weigh a lot less or are they lean mass to lean mass really just eating the amount of calories that that lean mass describes? And I know that there's a lot in there, but um, yeah, uh, please go ahead, Ted. Oh yeah, well, I mean, both of you guys are, are right. They have really good points. Like uh, what Amber said is totally accurate and the uh, non-exercise activity is actually the biggest um, factor for when you're compensating for diet. So people who are overfeeding, you'll see just big changes in non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And then people who are um, underfeeding, you'll see big changes in, in non-exercise activity thermogenesis, just fidgeting and moving and stuff like that. So yeah, that, that, <clears throat> that non-intentional, non non-exercise stuff is huge. That's actually the biggest thing that changes when you're over and underfeeding. So it's a major, huge, big deal. Um, and it, that is definitely tied into how much you're eating, like completely. So that is a very big deal. And then, uh, Ali, your, your point uh, is totally correct in that the, the lean mass is the biggest, biggest factor when it comes to basal metabolic rate. And so there is, um, you know, if you, that's part of the reason why the, the Hadza's um, uh, lean mass is not that much smaller than, um, well, it, it is smaller than uh, Westerners, but uh, it's the fat mass difference that's a lot bigger. And so, like, honestly, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, your whole goal there is to get 
more lean mass and less fat mass because the lean mass is more metabolically active and it allows you to burn more energy just in your BMR and it allows you to have a higher energy flux just sitting on the couch, which is why when you're losing weight, you always want to just lose pure fat if possible and maintain as much lean mass as possible. And the goal is to get this really high lean mass and really low fat mass. So then you're, you have a huge BMR, huge energy flux. You can eat a ton of calories. You feel good. You have plenty of energy for non-exercise activity thermogenesis like running around. And, uh, and then you're also um, thinner, which makes you more insulin sensitive and more metabolically flexible. And you have better metabolic health. And that's kind of the holy grail, I think, is high lean mass, low fat mass, high energy flux, eating a ton of calories. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love the the... The, the idea of the high lean mass, low fat mass and um, where exercise comes in. And I'd like to pick up on that later for sure. Um, I'd like to talk about the word fat for a bit because it's, it's used often interchangeably for you know, all types of fat. But um, Amber, you, you, you were talking about hormonal uh, differences in, in, in energy out the energy out definition and you know each type of fat consumed by humans will have different effects within the body all the way from the taste receptors to um satiety mechanisms in the gut nerves down to individual cells and mitochondria um so to me this is at the heart of the debate if you will about added fats and weight control so amber how does fat type influence metabolism do you think well, if I can make a, a quick diversion before answering that, um, I think part of the issue about hormonal responses has to do with, um, well, if there's some kind of dysregulation, either at the level of lipolysis or fatty acid oxidation, and the different types of fat can, can influence that as well, or some kind of disease condition could. But if you're in a kind of ideal situation, then when you're, say, your insulin to glucagon ratio goes low enough, you get high lipolysis, so you have a lot of access to fat coming from your adipose tissue. And then at, on the other side of it, you have um, high fatty acid oxidation um, to, to use that up, and that would be a perfectly smoothly working thing. Um, but if anything is disrupting either side of that, then then the picture becomes more complicated and in terms of of different types of fat it's actually it's actually quite interesting because it's not it's not a simple picture polyunsaturated fat actually stimulates fatty acid oxidation much more than saturated or monounsaturated does and that that can be considered a good thing it can lead to mitochondrial uncoupling uh, or, or to an increased rate of mitochondrial uncoupling which um, in, for many people is the holy grail of how do we increase our energy expenditure. Um, whereas on the other side of the coin, it doesn't seem to induce satiety as much through the through um, reactive oxygen species. So you may have heard of the ROS theory of obesity where saturated fat is doing a better job of inducing satiety at the, in the adipose cell, um, whereas the polyunsaturated fats are, seem to run rampant without closing off the uh, insulin glucose uptake so that your, your fat cells are just simply expanding through that. Um, and then it becomes even more complicated because uh, depending on context, what's available and what the hormonal situation is like, you will have different conversions between fats. You can have the polyunsaturated fats being elongated um, and then having different effects and, and um, many different things come into play when you start playing around with different fats. And I think that's a really good um, nuance to bring up because added fat, when you add fat, if you add fat and it increases your ability to lose weight or it makes you fatter, it's not just a matter of adding calories or adding fat because different different fats could have uh, a, a an influence there for example um 
I know that nuts and dairy seem to be particularly obesogenic and possibly for different reasons. So maybe there's an intolerance to dairy and it's causing some kind of inflammation or there could be growth factors, uh, a higher insulin response in, in the things that come along with that dairy. And in the case of nuts, one might, uh, there's a, certainly a popular idea that the kinds of uh, linoleic acid in particular would be particularly obesogenic. And so if you, if you are on this very high fat ketogenic style diet and it consists of a lot of nuts and dairy and then you remove it and then you lose weight, you might say, oh, I was just eating too much fat when too much fat isn't necessarily the problem specifically. Ted, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that you see some different effects with different types of fat. And um, interestingly, like, you know, saturated fat is is probably the worst when it comes to generating fatty liver and overfeeding. And uh, the, everyone's afraid of PUFA and linoleic acid right now in the paleosphere. But, but if you overfeed animals with uh, PUFAs, they actually don't get as fat. They tend to burn those off a little more readily. And, and then you see differences with like, you know, your short chain fatty acids, saturated fats are like more volatile and you might burn them off a little faster or more readily than longer chain. And so there's, there's definitely differences like, you know, your marine omega-3 fats are probably the, you know, very best when it comes to metabolic health and burning them off and not gaining weight. And so um, they're all slightly different when it comes to um, how readily you're going to burn them versus store them. And uh basically, you know, how a big picture health promoting they seem to be or not. And uh, however, I, th I honestly think that some people are trying to just drive their all their diet choices based on these subtle differences in fat types. And I don't know if that's like, I feel like it's a pretty small rock in the jar or a pretty small lever overall. And like, um, I don't, I don't recommend like a mono focus on just like, okay, how can I eliminate all linoleic acid from my diet and just get steric acid only, you know, like, I don't think that's going to be a huge, huge factor. And I think that, um, most people can get by on some radically different proportions of fat, but I, I do think there are some slight subtle, interesting differences and we, you know, nobody's figured all of it out quite yet. Um, as to what's going to be optimal for anyone. And then everyone's probably different. So yeah, there are differences there. I think it's really cool. It's really interesting. And I, uh, but I feel like that's not, shouldn't be everybody's like primary focus. I think the idea of linoleic acid depletion is pretty fascinating. I agree with Ted that it's probably not going to be the biggest factor, but I, I can't ignore the fact that some people have have told us that they got great improvements simply by removing linoleic acid from their diet. One wonders if, you know, what it was coming with, but if we, if we take that at face value, um, there could be, for example, reductions in, in tissue uptake. Like uh, Ted is completely correct about uh, polyunsaturated fats actually being much more metabolically active. They cause fatty acid oxidation to go up. And so you might think, well, actually I should really increase my PUFA intake if I wanna get the biggest bang for my buck. But on the other hand, at, at a certain level, you're going to start incorporating that into phospholipids and that can have damaging effects down the line that can actually decrease mitochondrial uncoupling. So that becomes um, complex and long-term. One of the more interesting things that that I have noticed about linoleic acid depletion is that um, if, if you go from, well, there's an experiment anyway, I don't know how much it's been confirmed in humans, but there's an experiment in rats where they, they fast them so they're like completely ramping up as much fatty acid oxidation as you can in that situation. And then they go straight from that into a very high carb, very low fat diet. And what happens is that it, it depletes linoleic acid acutely by converting it to arachidonic acid. Um, so what you get actually, you can induce <laughs> symptoms of uh, central fatty acid deficiency by, by doing that too long. And that it seems to be um, really ramped up by that transition from, from very high fat usage to no incoming fat. And I have wondered if, um, 
if that might be part of the reason that very low carb diets uh, are helping with obesity is that linoleic acid depletion insofar as that's a coherent theory. Uh, I mean, we have, I, I struggle with the linoleic acid part because we have tons of really interesting mechanistic stuff where it might be bad. But then if you actually look at outcomes in huge population, if you just look at, if you zoom out as much as you possibly can and just look at really big outcomes in really huge groups of people, it doesn't seem to like higher tissue levels of linoleic acid looks kind of good, actually. So, so I really struggle with, uh, big picture zoomed way out, um, out actual outcomes, it seems fine. And then if you like the tighter you zoom in on some of these mechanistic stuff, uh, I see arguments for why it might be bad, but then I'm like, where, you know, if linoleic acid's that toxic, where are the bodies? I just, you just don't, you just don't find them. So like, I, thought, I, I really struggle with all of that. I thought the epidemiology made at least a, a confirming case for the increase of linoleic acid in modern diets and the prevalence of obesity, even if it's just a correlation, it does, it does track well with it as far as I understood, but in my head, the, 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 the epidemiology, um, the, the interesting result from India in the 60s on the, you know, the, the railway workers, I think the paper was written by a guy called Malhotra, no relation to Asim, um, showed that there was 7x the heart disease in the uh, populations in, oh, I'm going to get it wrong now, it's either the north or the south, who cooked with peanut oil, um, um, you know, tended to be more vegetarian, and uh, compared to the um, the the other uh, extreme, who uh, you know ate lamb, cooked with animal fat, ghee particularly, um, I, I I'd be interested to to list in the show notes uh, some epidemiology showing something different um, that confounded that for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like most of the biggest. Um, meta-analyses uh, looking at, um, you know, saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat, you just really don't see this big signal that, you know, PUFAs are deadly and linoleic acid's toxic. And so, yeah, I, I just feel like that's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just not as afraid of PUFAs as like everybody else. I'm not sure why. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually... I, please on you go, Amber. <laughs> I'm actually kind of with you on that. I'm I I I'm interested in the linoleic acid theories, and I think some of them make a lot of sense. But I'm in well, at least in the context of a low carb diet, I think that um, there's interplay that makes them not as important a factor. Yeah, I would I would uh, err on that side too. That um, in in a ketogenic context, there seems to be less case for um you know laying the blame for damage with linoleic acid um i do wonder with epidemio modern epidemiology if there is enough of a potential signal there you know between populations or whether it gets lost in the noise you know whether you're really looking at two populations who are high enough in linoleic acid um in their tissues that the, the difference between the two is actually uh, meaningful or um, they're, you know, you know, they're sort of ones in the frying pan, ones in the fire, if you like. Um, just a theory, but you know, I, I've not seen anything that would necessarily go against that. Well, uh, if you look at studies of just tissue linoleic acid and cardiovascular outcomes, for example, there's no, there's no signal at all that it's causing like cardiovascular disease that's for sure um but yeah you're right there i mean there's a ton of confounders and but i i figure if it was like as toxic as like smoking or something something would there we'd see more of a signal in the literature and we just don't so it can't be that big a deal is i guess what i'm saying maybe <laughs> i think it's it's great to to keep that debate open and i suppose it's um in the spirit of what we're trying to do today, it sounds like an area that you both broadly agree with. So maybe we should pick up on, um, on, on, on something that you kind of hinted at before, Ted, which is um, 
about you know protein and uh, satiety and something we spoke about before agreeing to do this, which was you know the protein leverage hypothesis. So that comes up again and again. Um, maybe Ted, could you explain what it is and why it's helpful to your understanding? Gotcha. Okay. Well, the uh, protein leverage is basically something discovered by Dr. Drabenheimer and Simpson, who are these uh, uh, researchers in Australia. He realized that in um, the majority of animal species, uh, there is this nutritional geometry where um, an animal uh, that has access to multiple foods will eat a little bit of one food, a little bit of another food. And what they're doing is combining foods to get a reasonably good amount of protein and a reasonably good amount of energy. And uh, these are all, all on a U-shaped curve where there's like too little protein, too much protein, and then a good amount of protein. And then there's like too little energy, too much energy and a good amount of energy. And animals will um, basically mix and match their foods automatically and uh, uh, to try to get enough of both protein and energy. But protein is very, very tightly conserved in a lot of animals and there's a lot of protein leverage that means they'll go out of their way to get enough protein they're prioritizing that and uh, then animals have different rules of compromise if they're locked in a cage with just one food that's low protein they might uh, under eat and go with not enough protein to not over eat calories but uh, other animals will eat until they get enough protein even if it means they have to over eat calories and uh, basically it turns out that humans have a fairly powerful protein satiety drive and that they will um, frequently overeat calories in order to get enough protein and uh, so that um, it becomes a problem in the modern food environment where protein has been diluted with refined carbs and refined fats you know we just dumped all this sugar and flour and oil in the food supply and the protein percent drop, and then your average human is going to eat until they get enough protein, period. And they'll frequently end up overeating calories, passively just trying to get enough protein to not be hungry. And, and what's interesting is just how insanely tight the protein conservation is. So if you look at the last 60 years of the obesity epidemic, right, and you look at what people ate before and after the amount of pro the percent of protein is like, you know, very, very similar. I mean, it's only changed a tiny bit. The amount of protein is super, super tight. It's like, you know, a, you know, a dozen grams more now than it was before. And we all have large bodies, but um, you get this really, really tight conservation of protein. Everyone's eating like, you know, 200 calories more a day of carbs and another 200 for fat. And, uh, but protein, boom, exactly the same. You also look like, all over the world, there are these crazy variations in carbs versus fat, right? In Japan, they eat this really high carb, really low fat diet. And in Germany, they eat this higher fat, lower carb diet. Uh, but protein is just, boom, 14 to 15% of calories. Every population on earth, anywhere you look. I mean, just on average, big picture, statistically, like individuals are a lot more variation. But you see this really narrow protein range and then huge swings in carbs and fats, and also some significant differences in energy intakes based on um, body fat percentages and stuff like that. Um, but the protein is just really a like absolute amount of protein and protein percent is fairly tightly conserved uh, on big statistical population bases. And so uh, I just think we all need to be paying a lot of attention to the protein percent of our food because that seems to be a big driver of how many calories you're going to eat and in fact, um, looking at humans specifically, between 10% and 25 to 30% of protein on just a regular eucaloric maintenance diet, you see a really strong uh, protein, uh, like almost a 10 to 1 gear ratio, where for every calorie protein you eat, you eat 10 fewer calories of carbs and fats in this 10% to 25%, 30% protein range. Uh, it's just super powerful and super linear in this zone. Now, when you go, but it's it's very, it's not linear at all. Actually, when you go look really, really low protein, like 5% protein, that's your potato hack, that's your fruitarian diet, uh, intakes go way, way down. People eat way less. It's paradoxically a U-shaped curve. And then if you try to drive behind uh, above 30%, the 
uh, you get super diminishing returns. It just falls way off. It's nowhere near as strong that there is an effect all the way up to about 50% protein. And then it just falls off a cliff. It's just like totally worthless. So that I, I think there's just this narrow band in which there's a pretty significant protein leverage, protein satiety effect that I think people should just at least be aware of. I just think that's something that people need to know about because most people don't. Yeah, it's interesting that if the if the population average is fourteen to fifteen percent worldwide, um, but the you know levels of um, excess calorie intake for one reason or another seems to vary from place to place, then I wonder how can that be? You know, is um, how can what I mean is how can fourteen to fifteen percent if it's the average really represent the intake of the individuals and you said it yourself the individual intake varies so um where does that 14 to 15 percent really really land in reality oh right right okay yeah i mean that's excellent so basically if you look at worldwide hunter gatherer macronutrient percents the the protein is like maybe 30 percent on average it's just way higher than like the standard american diet which has actually fallen down to about 12 and a half percent in america um we're you know the fattest well we're not the fattest but we're we're, not, we're doing poorly uh and then you if you look at different populations like if you look at everyone uh who's had long-term weight loss success in the national weight loss registry they're averaging you know 19 or 20 percent protein um so these people have lost weight they're thinner and they maintain a higher protein percentage if you look at people who reverse um, you know, type two diabetes, that's even maybe a little higher, 25 or 30%. If you look at um, uh, fitness uh, aesthetic competitors, um, you know, your bodybuilders, your bikini models, your aesthetic fitness um, um, athletes, they're, you know, typically all north of 30% protein, 30, 35, maybe 40%. Um, and so you see these different phenotypes at different protein um, intakes. Uh, and so on an individual level, it's all over the map and it does tend to be uh, related to body fat percentage. So like the, like we were talking about the Hadza, uh, their diet is 27% protein. They're super high carb. They eat all this fruit and honey. They're eating a shit ton of carbs. Oh, can I say that? I'm sorry. They're eating a lot of carbs, uh, but they're 27% protein. It's, uh, you know, at more than double the standard American diet or about double the standard American diet. Um, so there does seem to be a relationship between protein percentage and body fat um, amount within a certain range. But then again, like I said, it gets really weird where um, if you go, if you become a fruitarian and just eat 30 bananas a day or whatever, um, you also get thinner um, because you just kind of give up on eating because what's the point? And so there, <laughs> there are some weird effects there. But yeah, so it's very different on an individual level. And the, that 40 to 15 percent is just if you just zoom out and look at an entire country and you just compare countries and then the whole world. They're at this kind of uh, narrow protein band on average. Yeah, I'm curious again about cause and effect. You know, each of the populations that you talked about have, I guess, uh, different constraints and incentives to eat the way they do. For example, there's, um, there's something cultural about the Japanese eating lots of rice. There's something um, about the Hadza being pushed into areas that wouldn't necessarily be their ancestral uh, hunting grounds. And maybe um, eating what they eat is, is to an extent forced by um, a, you know, um, westernized influences pushing them into uh, different states. Um, someone who wants to look like Arnie is likely to choose to eat in a particular way. I wonder if we even know how uh, much protein we tend to eat if we're just left alone with, um, you know, healthy foods. Does that kind of data even exist in a uh, in a meaningful way on a large scale, I wonder. Uh, I mean, not really, but I do think that if you just uh, force someone to hunt and gather, he would see their protein percent, uh, you know, go way up compared to the supermarket. <laughs> but I think that that's actually a reflection of the lower fat availability of, of modern wild game. 
I mean, there are there are reports of people who hunt for their subsistence and they will actually throw away carcasses that are insufficiently fat. Um, they, if all you're left with, if you're kind of forced into carbohydrate for energy, it's it's quite possible that your protein, um, that what you settle on for protein is going to be higher than if you had had more fat available. That 15% is really interesting to me. It, it's stuck, it struck me because that is exactly the amount that Verda Health has been using for their recommendations, which uh, more specifically, they, they say, I think 1.5 or 1.4 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of reference weight, but they specifically say eat 15% calories by calorie, if you really want to call protein a calorie, but <laughs> um, from protein, and then eat fat to satiety after that. Um, so I, I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea that the that people who lose weight best necessarily are doing it on a higher amount than that, because you, that's that's essentially the amount that we need. And whether you get your energy from protein or fat after you've reached adequacy, then all that's left for that is going to be hormonal effects. And those hormonal effects are going to be different comparatively if the comparator is carbohydrates versus if the comparator is fat. I mean, drastically. Replacing carbohydrates with protein should have a, a, a very um, anti-obese Ogenic kind of effect, whereas replacing um, fat with protein, it's not quite so clear what would happen there. Um, well, I mean, in, in animal models, you can basically, you can pretty much take any omnivore mammal and replace either carbs or fats with protein. And as you give them an ad-lib diet with higher and higher protein percents, they literally just eat less calories and get thinner, um, all the way up to about 50%. You can feed a lab rats a 50% protein diet and you'll just get the lowest fat mass, highest lean mass rats you could, you'll ever find, um, whether you replace carbs or fat and they just get thinner because the it's uh, probably due to satiety factors and also the thermogenic effect of protein, you know, it's, you know, you, you know, maybe given three calories per gram at possibly way less than that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I do think that, um, I hear what you're saying. You're like, okay, why just eat all the protein you need and stop there and then just throw that on top of that. Um, because it's cheaper or, or because, you know, your ketones are higher. But then again, uh, there does seem to be evidence that the higher your protein percent, the less you eat on an ad lib diet, all the way up to 50%. And anyone who doesn't believe me needs to try to eat a 50% protein diet and see what happens. Like you just cannot, you cannot eat as much. It's you're just done. I, I know of a lot of people who actually become ravenous when they eat protein. And it, it may have to do with this inability to either get lipolysis or get fatty acid oxidation, because if you're not getting that signal that your energy has increased from your food, um, then that's, you're not going to get satiety. And can and I jump if, in there? Can I jump yeah. in there, Amber, just to ask for these uh, stories, you say people become ravenous. Do you know what they become ravenous for? <laughs> well, for fat or carbohydrate, I suppose. I mean, you could even go back to the the explorer stories of rabbit starvation, and that would be in someone who's presumably lean and very fit. And so you could say, well, yeah, of course they're they're running out of fat on their own body. And so you see, you can you can see all these ethnographic reports if you look in the literature of people becoming ill, people becoming ravenous because of their, they're eating only lean animals like rabbits and until they get fat they just will not um, stop eating and that would be the the kind of flip side and, and ted even alluded to this where once you once you get to a certain amount of protein the, it's the energy that is driving it's like an energy leverage hypothesis which simpson and Rabenhauer also agree to um, so what i've been speculating is that there's a connection between rabbit starvation and very lean people and people who get that kind of ravenous hunger when they're given only protein and, and also not just 
not just hunger, but lethargy, um, mood problems. I, I've had this myself when I've tried uh, protein sparing modified fast type diets that my mood tanks and my energy, my temperature. Um, and, and I think that it goes back to that idea that if you, it, you could have a whole bunch of fat mass, but if something is preventing you from uh, properly getting it out of adipose or from burning it as fat, you won't get the metabolic signal that yes, we now have plenty of energy, even if there's plenty visually to spare. Um, I also wanted to bring it back to the idea of the, so we're talking about the, the limits of protein leverage hypothesis. So when you get to a certain amount, um, and maybe for some people it is 50% before that starts to drop off. Um, so there's definitely a limit on that side where suddenly you get energy leverage. But on the other side, 5% um, is the amount that Simpson and Robinheimer, Robinheimer have said they don't expect to see those effects. And, and Ted was saying, well, maybe the reason is you, you try to eat and because the protein percentage is so low, it, it's not enough to trigger a signal to keep eating more because why would you? Because it's, it's, it's too low. Um, but there is a study, um, Kennedy is the first author, I don't remember the name of the study. It's uh, something like a ketogenic diet produces a unique metabolic uh, state in, in mammals. And it was one of the first studies that was exploring what happens on a, in a ketogenic state with an animal model. And what they had was three different, um, I, I believe they were mice, um, definitely rodents. Um, one of them, one of the groups was on a 5% protein diet and one was on um, the others were closer to 20%, I think. And what was really interesting was that the all of the groups ended up eating not the same amount of protein, but the same amount of calories to within a very close amount. Uh, but because of the, the ketogenic one is at, what was at 5%, that means that they were eating if, if protein leverage had worked at that 5% level, they would have had to eat five times as much to get the same amount of protein, but they didn't eat more calories. Their calories is what matched. And so I, I've pointed that out to Simpson and Robinheimer. They said, yes, we know it doesn't work below 5%, but I'm not sure I really buy that that is what is happening in that case. I think that in the ketogenic situation, the the fat is coming in for more satiety than it would if you were replacing that with carbohydrates. But between animal studies and human studies, I think that our, um, our what we're optimized for from a metabolic perspective is maybe too different to get the answers that we're looking for by looking at animal studies. I wonder um, when we think about the PE diet, you know, you've got the, the protein Y axis and the, the energy X axis. And there's a kind of um, good and evil vibe to it. Um, you know, do you think there's a case for having a, um, an axis that comes out of the page that has something more to do with uh, nutrition, um, you know, or even a, a rebalancing of, of the, the idea that uh, it's about protein versus energy and some other formulation where it's really... Uh, a hunt for nutrition that we have. And I know calories can be seen as separate to nutrition, but of course there's all sorts of fat soluble vitamins that go into the hormonal signaling. And, you know, it comes, it, there's a question that came up uh, when, I, when I put it up on Twitter that we were, we were talking today um, about whether denatured protein, like blended or pulverized protein is equivalent to a steak, you know? Um, and are we really talking about uh, instead of protein versus energy, it being um, nutrient poor versus nutrient rich and getting the, the whole panoply that we require, um, plus calories from wherever, you know, is that, is that a, a reasonable reformulation, do you think, Ted, or am I missing something? And yeah, no, yeah, the, the, the PE diet is just a, just a really low budget, um, super basic kludgy kind of uh, approximation for really what you're saying is nutritional density versus energy density. So like, you know, nutritionally dense foods, which are ideally 
um, you know, uh, nutrition in cellular form and you're getting, um, you know, my, uh, all your minerals and vitamins and essential fatty acids and essential amino acids and all of these nutrients, uh, without just like sugar and oil or whatever, you know, some just pure calorie type thing. And so you're right. It's really just a kind of a proxy for nutritional density versus energy density. And it's just a really big picture way of looking at it. And it, it fails all over the place. Like it just, you know, like if I'm an endurance athlete and I'm, you know, if I'm Zach Bitter and I'm, you know, running, you know, hundreds of miles a week and I'm burning 6,000 calories a day, the PE ratio, you just basically throw it out the window because you actually want just sugar and oil or just whatever the easiest to digest, you know, energy source you can get. And so there are all these caveats and all these individual things and whatever. And so it's just, it's just like a really super big picture, low budget heuristic. Um, although I do think it's an interesting way of looking at diet and it does explain, um, a few things. I mean, but you know, it has massive limitations. I, I also, I, I agree with Amber in that anyone who there's definitely energy leverage and anyone who's going too low in energy is going to just be hungry and starving and feel terrible. And uh, you will absolutely see that happening on these higher protein percent diets. Now, I, I, I what I don't want people to think is that um, I think all of that is not from protein. It's, it's from low calories. So like, uh, for example, we have protein overfeeding studies where you take people who are, are on a diet where they feel good, everything's fine. They're great. They're happy. Um, plenty of protein, plenty of calories. And if you dump a thousand calories of protein on top of that in protein overfeeding, um, people feel uncomfortably over full, but they're not like starving. They don't gain weight. They don't go out of their way to eat more carbs and fats. And so it's not, it's not like protein made me hungry and protein made me eat more. Um, no, it's it, that if your calories, if your energy is too low, you're going to be hungry and you're going to need to eat more and you're going to have low energy and you're going to feel bad. And anyone with a low enough energy calorie is going to feel terrible. And we, you know, we just see this all the time in like in the well, like in the, you know, in the bodybuilding world, you've got Tristan Lee, who's this very low carb ketogenic kind of bodybuilder. And, you know, he's on YouTube and everything, and he's maintained 4% body fat for the past two years and documented all the stuff he eats. And it's just like sirloin, eggs, uh, sardines, fish, uh, shrimp. It's just like super leanish proteins and uh, it's, he's eating basically two grams of protein, one gram of fat and doing uh, two strength workouts a day and an hour of cardio. And he's 4% body fat. And he, his diet was about 47% protein. And he just felt like crap the entire time. Like, like he just felt awful. Like it was horrible. Um, but that does get people really, really thin. So the, the point is that there is a protein leverage that's real, uh, but uh, you're just going to get thinner and just feel awful. And so it's really bad. And so I honestly think both protein and energy is on a U-shaped curve where there's too high, too low, and then something pretty good. Uh, most people have a range where they can function reasonably well. And a lot of things are possible. Not everything's optimal. And if you're looking for optimal, it's going to be like somewhere in, in between and it's not going to be crazy. Yeah, I was chatting oh. to, I was, sorry, on you go. Oh, I was just going to agree with Amber that um, uh, ketones, I absolutely agree that uh, ketones, uh, we have plenty of evidence that ketones provide some type of satiety. So there are people who, uh, as their ketone levels go up, uh, they're just really, really not hungry. We see suppression of ghrelin. We see appetite. We see hunger scores go down. We see satiety scores go up. And so there is something uniquely... Um, appetite suppressing and satiating uh, about higher ketone levels. And I think some people uh, get more benefits from that than others. And so there is a unique, uh, there is a unique benefit to ketosis. So I absolutely agree that if you're comparing a ketogenic study to a non-ketogenic study, you can't really do a, a crossover because there is a ketone effect that's very real. Thanks. Yeah, I had a feeling that we agreed on a lot more than it sometimes seems. Um, one thing that uh, occurred to me while you were talking is that it's it's not necessarily just ketones. I tend to think of, well, ketones do have that effect, but 
often um, they're just reflecting the, the metabolic state. And something that's interesting that happens if you are looking at um, fasting, for example, where most of the literature about <laughs> ketosis comes from, there's this adaptation period for the first couple of days where ketones go high, but um, only to a limited amount. And then after a few days, they go way, way higher. And what has been determined is that ketogenesis hasn't actually gone higher, but what's happened is the muscles have, for whatever reason, decided, okay, we're not going to use those ketones now the way we were at the beginning of fasting. We're going to only use uh, fatty acids. And then this has this beautiful synergistic sparing effect because now um, the ketones in the blood go way up and there's a lot more available for tissues that really need it because they can't use fat. And sometimes what I wonder is if you're, um, if you're doing a, a higher protein version of a ketogenic diet uh, for people who are more sensitive and are not get, their ketones are not getting as high, um, the, I'm wondering if that is a reflection of being so, sort of not all the way into keto adaptation because maybe because of the insulin and glucagon dynamics of the increased protein such that the muscles are still happily chomping up the ketones. And if, you know, that might be perfectly fine for some people, but for other people who um, have different needs for ketosis, which obviously not everybody does, um, if that's a reflection of the metabolic state being at a kind of halfway point and not as fully fat adapted in, from a muscle perspective as you would be if you were seeing the ketones start to skyrocket. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you absolutely see higher ketones when carbs are very low and proteins lower. As protein goes up, ke ketosis goes down. As carbs go up, ketosis goes way down. And while we have, uh, you know, we have ketogenic, uh, I have studies where um, uh, eighty percent of calories came from protein and zero carbs, and people are still in ketosis. I have studies where uh, we have up to one hundred ninety-two grams of carbs a day, and people are still in ketosis. There, all the you can, uh, you can. There's a pretty wide variation of protein and carb where you're still in ketosis, but the lower protein and carb get, the higher the ketone level. And if you're someone who is benefiting hugely from the ketosis. Uh, you actually do want to be higher fat, lower carb, lower protein. Like, like some people, I think, get a, a like a mystical, magical benefit from the ketones. It's like, uh, like we we've you know, you know uh, we've known forever that it has this literally magical anti seizure effect, which is very real and very well documented and absolutely not just anecdotal. And so people are getting literal magical neurologic benefits from ketones. And uh, we have, you know, uh, anecdotes of like, you know, anything from, uh, you know, depression and bipolar and schizophrenia and all of these neurologic conditions. And so it, if someone's goal is uh, the benefits of higher ketone levels, yeah, uh, lower protein, lower carb. If I was benefiting from the ketones, if my goal was the ketosis, and if I just felt better or functioned better with higher ketones, I would probably be on your uh, two grams of fat to one gram of protein diet. I could totally do that. I could eat 90 grams of protein a day, 180 grams of fat a day. That'd be like 2000 calories. I would function just fine. And I would be in a deeper ketosis than I am currently. And uh, if, if I had a uh, benefit from the ketosis, either in like, I, I especially benefited from the hunger suppression, or I especially benefited neurologically, um, then that would be uh, idyllic. So like, I, I absolutely acknowledge that there's this very wide range of um, protein versus fat or protein versus energy ratios that will get you different outcomes. So if your if your goal is the ketones, if they're really helping you, sure, two grams of fat to uh, one gram of protein. However, if your goal is to get the highest lean mass and lowest fat mass, you want to be doing what the most of the ketogenic bodybuilders are. Look at like Rob Goodwin over at Ketogenic Bodybuilding. He's basically at the two grams of protein to one gram of fat zone. That's pretty much where everyone is 
over there. So you're going to get uh, the highest lean mass, lowest fat mass, bodybuilding, um, you know, body composition, uh, insulin sensitivity type stuff over on it. two grams of protein, one gram of fat. Uh, but you're going to be a little hungrier. You're going to get the um, highest ketones and the most ketone benefit at two grams of fat to one gram of protein. And then you've got to kind of got this middle of the road where like me and Sean Baker hang out at one to one, one gram of fat to one gram of protein. And so there's this, there's this range. And I, and I just think there's room for every approach in there and people have to find out what's optimum for them. And it's just good to be aware of what outcomes you're going to get on either end of the spectrum. Yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, I have one disclaimer and one addition. The disclaimer is I often advocate for two to one fat to protein, and I have uh, tried that with some success at certain times, but actually almost all of my carnivore career, as it were, um, I've also eaten one to one. One to one is where I tend to fall ad libitum. One to one is where I lost the vast majority of all my weight. It was very comfortable. Um, and it worked very, very well for me. And I think that's true of most people who are on a carnivore diet is that one, if there's something uh, very attractive for some reason to the body, to that one-to-one. -one. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other point I wanted to make is um, because it, definitely if you want higher ketones for whatever um, reason, for a health reason, it makes you feel better and all that, then then I agree with what you said about that. But the other thing that's interesting to me about ketone levels is that it can reflect your ability to burn fat. So I, I got very sick a couple of years ago and I lost fasting tolerance. It was really distressing actually. So it used to be that if I fasted within a couple of days, I could have ketones go up to say five um, and, and glucose could drop <laughs> really crazy precipitously, uh, but it wouldn't matter with that high ketones. And then after I got ill, fasting, I still would sometimes be only at like one millimole um, and, and feeling um, just not good as if I were as if I were really lean and had an energy deficit. And um, when I, in that situation, when I added a lot of fat and just a little bit of protein, so when I went to a two to one um, PKD style carnivore diet in that situation, I suddenly got ketones that were way higher. Obviously, it's in part because of the fat that I'm that's in my diet that's burning. Um, but I also lost seemed to I, I mean, I can't prove that it was fat mass, but I also seemed to lose fat on that compared to just fasting. And so um, the ketonemia that you develop, it, it, it can be a reflection of how low your protein is, but it can it's also a reflection of how much free fatty acids you have available, right? And so if, if there's something interfering with your lipolysis or with your fatty acid oxidation, you might expect to get lower ketones even when your protein is only at adequate level. And in, in that situation, adding fat um, might just be revving up your, your whole fat metabolism to a point where you can, where you can get energy and feel good. Whereas um, if you're getting your energy uh, from from protein or from your own fat mass, such that the ketones aren't developing, but you still feel good. I think that reflects a different metabolic state. And I don't know that I can adequately s describe what is the difference there because I would be speculating and we don't really have the research. But I think that there's, mo there's more to it than just the effect of ketones on the brain, but the, but the fact that the ketones are reflecting higher fat oxidation. Um, yeah, I do th agree that stress and cortisol is going to screw everything up and uh, you're going to have your ketones will drop from that. Uh, also, but also in these stress to high cortisol states, you're, um, lo you're losing more lean mass. You're, you're literally breaking down more lean mass. You're doing more gluconeogenesis. That's part of why it screws up your ketosis. And I don't know exactly what the best thing to eat then is, but yeah, you're going to basically see, um, you know, uh, higher blood sugars, um, lower ketosis, more lean mass losses, 
less. Um, it's it's just kind of bad. And I and I don't know. To, to me, I would be like, oh, that's the time when you want to eat more protein. But unless you're really, really benefiting from the ketones, and then I can see why you'd want to eat more fat at that point. Yeah, it sucks to be sick. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been interesting to see um, people respond to yourself, Ted, um, who say that they can only really gain the the body composition that they want if they up the fat and it's hard to know exactly what the mechanism is there you know if they are the type of people who benefit massively in their mental health for example from having jacked up ketones then um, it might even be that their mood is the confounder and that it drives them to eat in a way on higher protein that actually um causes them to gain weight it's really hard to understand when you hear stories from individuals exactly what's going on there um you know amber do you think it really is down to individual variations on um lipolysis and fatty acid oxidation or is there something else going on well i don't know that's a good question and i think that you know it's true that a lot of the people in the bodybuilding community tend to do the higher protein and it works well for them. I think that's partly because they are metabolically healthy, but I don't think that we have actually adequately tested whether higher protein is better than higher fat in that population. And I can think of one person off the top of my head anyway, uh, Keto Savage or Robert Sykes. Uh, he is definitely athletic and uh, very high lean mass, very low fat mass. And he eats a two to one fat to protein diet to maintain that leanness. So I, although I do think there are individual differences, especially with respect to people having certain illnesses. So for example, lipedema would be something that causes inability to access fat from your adipose, whereas type two diabetes would be something that limits your ability to oxidize fat, even though the free fatty acids might be rushing in, uh, the, the ACC is, is, turn, is just turning that right back into, into fat through lipogenesis. But on the other hand, if we look at, if we're just going to look at people who are actually very fit and healthy and have a lot of metabolic flexibility, I, that's a place where I would really like to see more research on what the various um, responses would be to to different diets because I think that a lot of people who have that flexibility do the higher protein because that's what's done and not necessarily because they've tried both and found that it was better. Mm, there's, a, there's clearly a cultural influence and incentivization. Um, Ted, what are your thoughts on the on the existing data on that? Um, uh, wait, existing data on what? I'm sorry. I guess on um, the chicken and egg situation of high protein being the driver of this leanness compared to, um, you know, the the fact that it, it, it works for a subset, but might not be um, any more effective than uh, another strategy involving a higher fat to protein ratio. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Okay. A couple of things. First of all, uh, protein percent is... There are uh, so many other satiety per calorie factors like energy density and fiber. And uh, uh, there's also a particular magic when either carbs or fat is very low. And you will see um, people having incredible body composition and success on much lower protein diets, uh, very, very high carb diets. Uh, it's all over the board. Like I see people who... Um, they're, you know, they're all eating, you know, 90 grams protein a day, but they're a vegan bodybuilder. They're, they're literally 10% fat, 10% protein, 80% carbs, and they're just ripped and jacked and can kill all three of us with their bare hands. And I literally see this all the time. And so I, I feel like there's, there's such a wide range and there's so much individual variability. Okay. So, you know, you know what a waterfall plot is like you, you do any study and like you take a hundred people and feed them something, and then you generate a waterfall plot, which is the lines of like who lost weight and always way out here on the right is somebody who like gained weight 
or somebody who had like the opposite effect. Like you can do an exercise study, waterfall plot, you know, 90% of them lost weight, got stronger, everything's great. And then there's a couple of people on this end who actually got worse. They got like weaker and it was bad, you know? And I could, you could take, I could design a study, the, the vending machine junk food diet, right? Where I take a hundred people and I just put them in a, a building with free vending machines with nothing but junk food. I'm like, all you eat now is junk food. Just eat junk food. Like you're not trying to lose what you just did. And like, you know, you generate the waterfall plot. Everybody's going to gain a billion pounds and feel awful. And then there'll be a couple of people at the end who like, I just lost a bunch of weight. This is amazing. Like I, I love this food and I just eat one and I'm totally satisfied. I've been wanting to eat a moon pie for decades and I thought I couldn't, but here I go. And like, there's always outliers and there's always somebody on the fringe. And so uh, what I've learned from 20 years of primary care medicine is that anything can do anyone to anything can do anything to anyone, anytime. And like, there's always somebody who had the, exact polar opposite response to whatever. And so like you've got Robert Sykes doing two grams of fat to one gram of protein. You've, he's kind of like at the edge of the waterfall plot because most of the other ketogenic bodybuilders are the other side, the two grams of protein, one gram of fat. But there's always somebody out there who like, maybe he's getting this crazy satiety from the ketones. Like that's way out of proportion to everybody else. And so there's just so much variability that um, almost anything's possible. And then very few things are optimal. And then what's optimal is different for everyone. And then it changes on your situation and everyone has to, it's just a moving target. It depends on, you know. So like, I, I think really, I just want people to know what some of the levers are they can pull and why that might be helpful, but it's like, uh, it's gonna be different for everyone and and every situation. Um, I think the, the protein percent, it is only uh, applicable to just giant populations. Like if you look at your average American who's eating, you know, your average American female is eating 70 grams of protein a day and the male is eating 90 grams of protein a day. Um, and they're eating like 300 grams of carbs a day, right? Your average person is going to benefit directionally from eating something less on the carb side and something more on the protein side. And that's just like my basic point is that like big picture directionally, most people should probably get their protein a little higher and their non-protein energy a little lower, probably carbohydrate for the average person uh, with the caveat that somewhere out there is someone doing the exact opposite thing who's way more successful than I am. And like, basically like a superhuman there. And the one other caveat I have to throw out there is like <clears throat> 10 or 15% of humans on earth are just freaking human cockroaches and could just live off of abject garbage. Like they could just eat like there, there's a tiny handful of people. And we all know somebody like this. They could just, their whole diet is just filet of fish sandwiches from McDonald's. That's like they, their they, motto. They just eat. They smoke 40 a day. Right. They just eat hot pockets and they just play Xbox all day and they're completely healthy. They're like ripped, they're jacked, they're insulin sensitive. Um, and, you know, that someday, like when junk food kills off the rest of us, they'll be alive and well. And they'll be like with the cockroaches after the nuclear holocaust. Right. And so and so like you have to just acknowledge that some people can just eat anything and they're fine. And if you try to do what they're doing, you're just going to die. And it's just makes it really confusing. Yeah, it's like that meme, you know, so at some point we have to consider what kind of world we're going to leave for Keith Richards. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, it's kind of glib to, you know, for, for each of us to go back to individual variation. But, I mean, you look at the studies that people cite around how well people lose weight on different diets but then how it rebounds and then you dig a bit you don't need to dig very deep and you find that people who just get told what to eat surprise surprise don't necessarily want to stick to it for very long you know um, there's a huge individual human psychology component to all of this where you can lead a horse to water you can't make a drink you can tell people facts and they often don't care I used to smoke a lot and it didn't stop me knowing that it was likely to cause lung cancer, heart disease, and all the rest of it. It was something else that made me stop. So, um, you know, it, it, the individual motivation and incentivization 
and cultural milieu is huge in all this. And we can debate about what happens in lab rats and what happens uh, anecdotally from individual to individual, but it usually dances around that fact, wouldn't you say? I have one thing to say about outliers. I agree that like <laughs> for any given strategy, there, there, it's not surprising if somebody has the opposite kind of response. But the the existence of outliers doesn't really answer the question, which is if you if if Robert Sykes is an outlier in terms of the dietary choice that he made, that still doesn't really tell us anything. If we took like if there are 99 bodybuilders who are doing a high protein, um, lower fat approach, and then Robert Sykes those are their chosen diets and they all worked well for them. But it doesn't answer the question of what if we put them all, like what if we put Robert Sykes on a high protein diet and what if we put those 99 other people on the lower protein, very high fat diet, what would happen? We still don't know if um, just because the diet that they chose and that they're doing is working really well for them that the other one wouldn't also work well or even work better. That, that's, the, that's the only thing that I would say about about outliers. We don't know if someone is an outlier until we actually do that particular study. And that's the study that's lacking in the low carb community is that really, uh, that really pure comparison of those two situations. We, we see people who it works well for, or who the other one works well for, or one that it doesn't work well for. But what we're not seeing is, is what happens when, when people are put on those in those different conditions not based on their choice, but um, what the actual physiological effect would be. Yeah, and coming oh, from... Oh, well, yeah. Sorry, on you go, Ted. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And you really have to randomize. To, to statistically know what's going to do what, you have to randomize people. Um, and uh, that's honestly very supportive of protein in that um, if you look at uh, randomized controlled trials of ad lib um, intakes, uh, Higher protein pretty much always yields to lower energy intakes than lower, almost in a perfectly straight line from about 10% of protein all the way up to 50% of protein. And we have specifically low carb studies comparing 15% to 30% of protein and 17% to 34% of protein and higher protein beats lower protein uh, on anything you can measure um, in a low carb setting, although not a very low carb ketogenic setting, it's like a hundred gram, 125 grams of carbs a day or hundred or something like that. But, um, basically, uh, on a, just a low carb diet, higher protein seems to be better than lower protein. Um, and in pretty much every single ad lib, uh, diet ever in the history of medical literature, higher protein, it leads to eating less calories than lower protein. Period. So like directionally, protein's awesome for eating less. I'm just going to throw in my, uh, for the record, um, contrarian note here in that, in that I have yet to see a study that, that controlled the variables right to know that even in a low carb context, if you're comparing 15 to 30%, then they did something like make it isocaloric. So we can't tell, uh, what the effect was. Um, I would really like to see, um, I would really like to see the, the, the study set up exactly to answer that question so that those um, questions about methodology don't come into play. Well, I mean, we do have, <clears throat> you know, isocaloric, iso low carb studies, literally replacing protein with fat and vice versa, uh, 15 versus 30, 17 versus 34, higher protein, definitely better for a body fat, hunger scores, satiety, emotional eating, triglycerides, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, anything you can measure better isocalorically replacing protein with fat uh, between those you ranges, 15 versus 30. If, you're, if it's isocaloric. Uh, well, I, uh, you can measure, you <laughs> yeah, you can measure hunger. I'm, I'm sorry, but hunger scores. Yeah. Hunger scores. Okay. Well, I wonder as well, Maybe you know, I'll the, link them. yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, if you send me what you've both talked about, I can, uh, I can link them in the show notes. And I do wonder, you know, about the word hunger as well. You know, we, we stripped apart the word fat for parts. Um, hunger, craving, 
comes to mind. You know, um, we live in a, a world uh, which is a kind of fever dream of our prefrontal cortex is we've created all these inventions and tools which have helped us to do amazing things. But we also have technologies like Krispy Kreme, which um, we're sort of in love with in a, in a sort of dark way. Um, does hunger mean I want a Krispy Kreme now? Or does it mean I want more protein or more fat? You know, I think, and, and then again, I've used the word fat to mean all fats. Um, can these studies correct for our addiction to uh, modern foods? No, and every single thing we've talked about so far is literally only half of the entire diabetes epidemic we're, we're 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 talking about just like this half maybe maybe half no uh because it's like 50 50 diet and exercise and uh, we're talking what we're talking about right now is 25 percent of diabetes a full half of it is just the addictive nature of refined carbon fine fats together and how hedonic it is and it's literally addictive so basically um <clears throat> humans are you know our, our whole existence we uh, we're, you know, starving for energy. We were trying to get enough calories to stay alive. We were absolutely seeking out fat. Uh, we were seeking out carbs. We would just like do anything to get these things. And it's all about, um, it's all about like the calories you expend to get food and then the reward of how many calories are in the food. So, you know, if you uh, hunt and gather all day and expend 2000 calories and you, all you get is like some lettuce and it's got 20 calories in it, you're just going to die out. But if you uh, hunt and gather for five minutes and you get a box of Krispy Kremes with, you know, 2000 calories, that's like amazing. That's like the, you know, the jackpots, a lot of, so every single person is wired to get the highest energy density food they can possibly get in their environment to maximize the cost of food acquisition with the reward from food itself. So you're literally wired to uh, be rewarded uh, hedonically with dopamine in an addictive way from high energy density food that just has a crap ton of calories in it. And so like a donut is the most rewarding thing ever. And everybody's wired for this and it's all over our food environment. And that's like half the problem. And it's, I don't know how to, <laughs> That I mean, that's really hard. Like you pointed out, like how much does any of this matter in the real world where, where people are like, I feel like a trend tape frappuccino because that sounds tasty. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, like uh, honestly, like being a, a primary care doctor is like being a personal trainer with the worst clients on earth who just hate exercise, eat donuts all day and kind of know what they're supposed to do but don't really care and just, they're just going to eat, you know, donuts. And so, yeah, that, I feel like a Full half of the problem is uh, that we're hedonically wired to eat the highest energy density carbon fat foods we can possibly find in our environment. And, and, and then a quarter of the problem is, like, uh, is the extra energy expenditure. We're literally wired to expend the very least energy and in ingest the very most energy. Like that, that's, uh, that's how you survive in an environment without a lot of food. You burn as little, you uh, move as little as possible and eat as much as possible. And that's why we have like remote controls and new reads and uh, yeah, fighting that. That's like, that's even bigger than all of this stuff we're talking. The, the whole protein energy thing, just like, that's like, that's literally 25%. And the bigger portion is we're literally wired to expend less energy and eat more energy. I think that highlights the difference between fat and carbohydrates, because like you said, there's a there's great reward to go after something that's energy dense. But the difference between those two is that one of them causes satiety and the other doesn't. And I think that from an evolutionary perspective, that that kind of shows that fat was available because it would not be good for an organism to not have in place regulatory mechanisms that recognizes when you get enough of something that's that's available in the environment. But something that's high in sugar is something that uh, would be, there's no reason to ever stop eating because you're gonna be limited by the environment. The environment never would have had so much that it would have been a problem to eat as much as you possibly can. I think that's what the difference is between uh, fat and sugar is not that one is less uh, or more rewarding than the other, but that one causes satiety and the other one doesn't. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I, I'll go a step further and say that carbohydrates are addictive. Like, like everyone says, okay, everyone says carbs aren't addictive, right? And everyone's like, oh, uh, what you're really addicted to is the combination of carbs and fats. It's mostly fat. That's why you're eating your pizza is mostly fat. Your donuts, mostly fat. Your candy bars, mostly fat. Your chocolate chip cookies, mostly fat. Your potato chips, mostly fat. You're really looking for fat. Um, uh, but no, there's a ton of foods that are pure carbohydrate with no fat in them at all that are super addictive and i can eat a ridiculous amount like skittles and licorice and red vines and dots and good in plenties and they're all there's like 20 candies i can name that are amazing have zero grams of fat whatsoever pure sugar pure carbohydrate and i find them very addictive and i could eat a ton of them and, oh, I will also disagree about carbohydrate. Uh, carbohydrate is very satiating in the first hour. Like acutely, it's the most satiating macro of all by a mile. And the, the first hour, like if you eat like a whole bag of Skittles, so you're like soup, that's amazingly satiating. And so you get this huge spike of satiety in the first hour, better than anything else. And then it just falls off hard and it's like hard negative three, four hours downstream where you're literally hungrier than if you hadn't eaten them at all. And so it's like the worst of all possible worlds where you get this, um, you know, reward and satiety initially. And then it's literally net negative later on versus protein and fat, which is just, just generally satiating on a much, 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 much longer time scale. Like you're just kind of nicely full, you know, for 12 hours after you eat your ribeye or whatever. And then the Skittles are like super satiating and then just a hard fall off to like a negative. And so, uh, but, but I agree with you. And that's why I think that carbohydrate re restriction is something that almost everyone is going to benefit from in the modern food environment to some degree. Well, I hope I get to a point in my health when, um, sugar becomes satiating it, even for a short period of time. I don't really experience that. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree that the long-term effect of carbohydrate seems to be this, this wonkiness with your, with your glycemia such that it creates more hunger in the long run than it, than it solved insofar as it did in the beginning. You know, I, I wanted to pick up on, on exercise a little bit. And um, I loved what Ted said earlier around, uh, you know, high energy flux. And you agreed with that, Amber, that that was probably a, a good goal. And we, we, we talked about, you know, the, the mechanisms there, high lean mass certainly being something that drives that. Um, and even perhaps high intake of certain uh, types of um, fat, or protein driving that, um, you know, what's the, what's the best way to exercise and reach that goal? Is it, Ted, do you think it's, it's muscle growth? Um, or do you think there's a, a, a case for uh, sprints or, or, or uh, long distance running or cycling or, or something else? Um, so I think that, uh, like there, there's several forms of exercise that are beneficial. Number one is just general movement and walking. And like, uh, if you look at healthy populations, they all, you know, they're walking eight, 10,000 steps a day. They have lots of general movement. They're having to move a lot. Um, so I think this walking and general movement is huge. Just, just as a human in order to be optimally healthy, I think you need a fairly high step count and a lot of general movement. And I think that's absolutely critical. And that's probably the biggest piece of all, to be honest. Um, uh, I also think that the more lean mass you can maintain, uh, the better it is for your basal metabolic rate and the higher your energy flux will be. Um, and the easier time you'll have maintaining um, fat loss. And so I think that the average person who's trying to maximize their uh, skeletal muscle uh, should be uh, lifting weights at least twice a week or some sort of resistance training. It can be body weight. So I uh, bare minimum, I think everyone should do a full body resistance exercise at least twice a week. That would be about at least, you know, half an hour, twice a week, push, pull legs. And that will uh, maintain, that will uh, either grow lean mass and make you stronger and give you more lean mass, which is 
basically associated with longevity and metabolic flexibility, uh, or it, it will um, give you uh, basically, uh, you know, like I said, a higher basal metabolic rate and all these metabolic advantages. So I think most people want to maximize strength and lean mass, you know, bone and muscle, and you want to do uh, resistance training at least twice a week, uh, half an hour, full body, push, full legs, that you want general movement daily, you know, eight, eight to 12,000 steps is a good goal, like the 10K steps is a kind of evidence-based. Um, and I don't think anyone really has to do high intensity cardio, but there's a massive association between VO2 max and longevity. Like, like if you look at, uh, you know, cardio respiratory fitness, VO2 max, and uh, how long you're going to live, that's more powerful than anything. It's bigger than, uh, you know, body composition, any way you look at it, body fat, weight, BMI, whatever, it's bigger than any dietary factor. It's bigger than any, um, <clears throat> that's probably the single biggest uh, thing associated with longevity is cardiorespiratory fitness via two max. So like, I think people should probably be trying to do some amount of cardio uh, at a little bit higher intensity to try to raise that or maintain that. Um, <clears throat> but that, that might be less critical than just general movement and being strong, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I think those are the three basic types of exercise everyone should be doing. Uh, step count, general movement, uh, full body strength training to get as much lean mass as possible, and then some sort of cardio to um, not only increase your calorie burn and have your energy flux be higher, but also raise your VO2 max, which is hugely associated with everything. Like, like people who are in good cardiorespiratory fitness and have high VO2 max are 12 times less likely to get Alzheimer's dementia. That just blows everything out else out of the water. It's so much bigger than low carb, low fat, weight loss, protein, all that stuff is just like dumb by comparison. Like, and honestly, if there's anyone out there listening to this, who's trying to optimize health, be thinner, be, you know, better, um, more metabolically flexible, and they're not exercising, just forget about your diet and go out and start doing this exercise, lift weights twice a week, uh, do a half an hour hard cardio every day, get a 10,000 per day step count, because that's going to be such a higher return on investment than any little thing you could do with your diet. And there's so many people in the diet space who are like, uh, I'm going to just eliminate all my linoleic acid. I'm like, no, just go out and, and get some exercise. It's going to be way bigger bang for your buck. Now, I will admit that after you do the, you know, 8,000 steps a day, resistance training twice a week, and maybe a half an hour cardio a day, uh, you get major diminishing returns. So you don't have to like be an endurance runner or, or live in the gym or like as you go beyond that, uh, the, the diminishing returns, there's a huge uh, just rigid ceiling to how much more is beneficial. So you, you really just need this small time and effort investment to get a massive benefit. But if you're not doing any of that and you start doing that, your your uh, return on that investment is going to be way bigger than anything you could do with your diet. I wonder I if it's, answer. sorry, on you go, Amber, please. <laughs> I love that answer because cardio is so um, picked on right now. <laughs> um, and I, I was going to ask a question uh, of Ted about that uh, and the VO2 max, because I'm wondering if you, if you have read any of the work on just working with breathing, for example, McEwen's oxygen advantage type stuff, and whether you think that uh, that kind of breath work can help with VO2 max in a positive way, even outside of the question of whether you're exercising or not. Yeah, I, well, absolutely. Like in exercise, like people who do nasal breathing only, for example, <clears throat> and try to get their wattage up but still just breathe through their nose. You tend to breathe more slowly, more deeply, more efficiently. You get better, more efficient oxygen exchange. You'll actually have better performance um, at, the, at the same heart rate. Uh, and so there's definitely a role for some of these breathing techniques. And the, the easiest, the cheapest, free, easy, low budget way to do it is try to do some moderate cardio and only breathe through your nose. You know what I'm saying? I think that's um, helpful for some people. Um, I don't, I have, I'm less aware of like what the breath work does in a, I'm not exercising setting, if you know what I mean. And if, um, 
if one wants to build muscle, Ted, do you think there's a one size fits all optimal nutritional strategy? Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are definitely evidence based dietary recommendations for natural bodybuilders that are really well vetted and well researched and people have researched the absolute hell out of this. And uh, if you're not at at least 1.6 grams per kg um, of, you know, lean body mass, you're probably leaving money on the table. And so uh, I do think that um, you know, there, there's not a ton of evidence for going above one gram per pound of ideal body weight or, uh, because, you know, they, they've studied, you know, going above that, it seems to have like microscopic beneficial uh, effects for people who are cutting really hard. So like, if you're just, if you're dieting down for a bikini model show or something, uh, going up to 1.2 grams per pound, uh, of protein is slightly 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 beneficial um for a couple of factors but uh, beyond that nothing uh but yeah if you're absolutely trying to maximize muscle building uh i like a gram per pound of ideal body weight uh and the evidence would definitely support 1.6 grams per um pound of lean body mass so that and for the average person with average body fat it ends up being you know close to a gram per pound it's a really good um, rule of thumb, if your goal is to, um, op if you're doing resistance, if you're doing optimal resistance training and you want optimal muscle growth, I would say a gram per pound of your ideal body weight for your height would be a really good, um, rough rule of thumb. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting area. You know, I, I love the idea of increasing lean muscle mass deliberately, um, for all the reasons that we've talked about and, but something that you see uh, in um, before and after pictures quite often from people who've posted them on, on like keto Facebook groups and that kind of thing is that they weigh roughly the same, but they look totally different. And that when we change how we eat and prioritize um, what you might call high quality foods uh, containing uh, nutritious protein and fat, that your tissues just improve in quality massively. And I wonder how much extra gain you get um, when you add some lean muscle mass compared to just, say, five to 10 years of eating nothing but high quality foods. I'd be really interested to know if there's literature out there that says anything about that. Do either of you well, know? I, um, I don't know about that. <laughs> But, but yeah, you're right. You basically, most people don't want to really weigh a lot less. They want to weigh better. They want to have more muscle and less fat. Um, and at the same weight, um, it's similar to how you don't want to just eat less calories. You want to eat better calories. You want to, um, eat the same you know amount of calories ideally, but just higher in, in nutritional value and lower in empty calories that you're, that you don't really need. And, but so, yeah, I do, I do like that, that, that recomposition idea. And I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, it was more of an observation. Um, and I guess when I brought up the exercise thing, I knew that it might be slightly off topic. And I don't know if Amber really has anything to add or any other thoughts about exercise particularly. Um, <clears throat> I don't think so. I, I've studied some exercise, but it, my expertise is obviously not the same level as Ted's in this area. Yeah, no problem. Maybe the last thing that I wanted to talk about, um, thinking more about what we were talking about earlier then, is, you know, if you could think of a dream study that might falsify your cherished belief about something we've talked about what would it be um and that's to to both of you i guess uh, amber could go first well as i've alluded to several times in this conversation already i think what would be really informative is a study that is specifically looking at different proportions of fat to protein um in in um i, I don't want to say in percent because i guess what i want to test is adequate protein and not more versus say three times adequate protein or, or some graduation along that. And to see if um, 
if it's really true that once you have enough protein, because that's what the question is, right? Like once you, you, you definitely don't want to get inadequate protein. Like Ted said, you're leaving money on the table if you're not getting enough protein in various ways, not just for building muscle, but for all kinds of health parameters. But once you have that, uh, what you need now is, well, you need micronutrients, but what, what you need is energy. And what source you choose for the rest of that energy is going to have some effect on the rest of your health. And I would really like to see that studied in the low carb, you know, I would love, especially in the carnivore context, because I think these different parts of what comes with vegetables like fiber and polyphenols could really um, make a lot of conflation. So if you were just looking at meat and different proportions of fat and try to keep the <laughs> kind of fat the same, what kind of results would you really get? That's that's the biggest question that's been on my mind for years now. Hmm. So I wonder if you would, you know, give one group uh, of a thousand people trimmed ribeye, another group slightly less trimmed and a third group untrimmed or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. You know, it's it's difficult with real whole foods because there's so much variance in each cut um, that it can be it can be a pain in the neck to try to figure out exactly what you're eating. So I guess in a clinical setting, if you had something like um, like some kind of pemmican or something that's very well controlled, but you know, even if you had it roughly controlled, I think it would be pretty informative. How many people would satisfy your curiosity in each uh, group? Oh my gosh, you're asking me to do statistical analysis on the fly. I don't know. Uh, I think even if we just had a pilot study of like 50 or 100 people in each side, it would at least give us something like a hypothesis to go on or some kind of interesting outcomes that we could compare. All right. Well, the gauntlet's been laid down. Um, <laughs> Ted, what would yours be, do you think? Oh, uh, well, like I have this just like totally impossible, unrealistic, ri ridiculous fantasy where I like take an infinite number of humans and lock them up in an infinite number of metabolic wards and I feed them every single possible variation of carbs, fat, and protein, you know, every gradient of all three. And I create this three dimensional map of the macros and look at outcomes like, you know, uh, uh, phenotype and body fat and uh, um, metabolic health and all these metrics of subjective and objective and how they look and feel and like just like every parameter possible and every outcome possible and just graphing it out in three dimension to see what just statistically is kind of, you know, close to optimal and, uh, and then, of course, I would uh, repeat this study an infinite number of times where I also changed fatty acid profiles and amino acid profiles and every other you know, energy density and all these other things. And then I just dump them all together and create this giant 3D map and the, the, uh, at least directionally can see what optimal for the average person is in terms of protein and fat and carbs and fiber and uh, energy density and combinations and blah, blah, blah. And that will cost approximately um, <clears throat> in trillions of dollars more than the number of atoms in the universe. And so I, <laughs> I, I'm basically challenging Kevin Hall to uh, start working on designing this. <laughs> well, I guess um, if data acquisition methods and uh, wearables and um so on continue to you know uh increase in popularity and sophistication in the way they have then i wouldn't be surprised if essentially that's what we're doing in 20 years and then 20 years after that we may just have approximately infinity data points you know maybe it'll be uh a, you know uh, a trillion data points or something but um is that is that would that be enough? No, uh, I mean, that would be selection. a cool start. <laughs> it's not <laughs> randomized, so oh, yeah. you don't know which direction the causality is going in. In a way, I wonder: Do we want it to be randomized? We live in the real world. We are subject to real forces. Um, isn't it almost just as important to choose exactly what's 
um, happening in the environment. For, exa for example, Verta gets uh, kind of attacked for offering um, support and counselling, but then, you know, isn't it a good thing that that is happening? Um, what I mean is uh, these metabolic ward studies can't be done infinitely in a way that's meaningful to the individual on the street in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think what you're saying is that for a given individual, there are only so many choices that they're actually going to make. And so there's no point in testing something that they wouldn't do. And I agree with that. But I also think that there are choices that people don't make because they don't know about them or they it, they don't have the right support or, or um, it doesn't occur to them. Um, and so somehow like opening the window of the, the scope of possibilities for someone might lead to a lot more information than if you just let them do what, the, stay on the trajectory that they're already on. Yeah, I mean, Amber's right. You, you really kind of have to randomize this to, to, really, to really know. And you can't have confounders like personal coaching or whatever. And my infinitely expensive study will be randomized and there won't be any uh, virtual coaching. And, and I, do, I think the criticisms uh, against Verda are uh, valid because if I um, offer someone uh, you know, a ton of handholding and support and all this other stuff, uh, the diet, uh, the actual diet might be even less effective than all of that. I could basically have people just eat nothing but pizza and then give them all this coaching and all this support and all this monitoring. And they're going to be way successful just from that. So that is a huge confounder. I, I have nothing against Verda, but I just, I acknowledge that that's a confounder and to really know you have to randomize. Uh, but then I also see your point, like, uh, Ali in the real world, um, uh, if we did have like a, enough observational stuff, like if we got, you know, data points from everyone on earth in terms of wearables and tracking and uh, it would be a lot better. And someday some AI is going to like, you know, track all of this stuff in real time and then figure out exactly what optimal is. And then realize that humans are the problem and just eliminate us all. And then everything will be great. <laughs> uh, this idea that AI will will hate humans i hope it's not true um maybe maybe amber's got a, an opinion on that for another day or we can talk about it on twitter when this episode comes out but if you if you two are both happy then um maybe we could we could call it a day there because i think we've covered a lot of ground yeah it's been great oh yeah absolutely okay great well um where can um, people find you both? And do you have anything particular coming up soon, Ted? Um, well, yeah, I'm on social media at Ted Naiman, like Twitter and Instagram and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I, I wrote the book, The PE Diet. And uh, uh, what I'm working on right now is uh, a new book and a concept, which is satiety per calorie, looking at all the different things that can improve satiety per calorie, including possibly higher protein, possibly higher um, fiber, uh, lower energy density, more exercise, but ketones are definitely a factor and that kind of thing. And so it's just like a little bit more like looking at all the different possibilities and it's not so just like protein mono focused, which um, I think is a very, very limited benefit you know what i'm saying so uh but yeah ted neiman on twitter is where i'm most active and i'm just working on uh this stuff in the background thanks amber yeah i'm also most active on twitter um keto carnivore is my the account where i talk about nutrition stuff my main account is actually very small and it's ambimorph and that's where i talk about more tech stuff um yeah Things coming up for me would be Keto Fest. I don't know if you or your audience knows, but I did a lot of research on the interaction between sleep and ketogenic diets. And actually satiety came into that. Uh, and I'll be doing a, a talk about the interaction between satiety and sleep and with, with particular relevance to the ketogenic diet. And then in August, I'll be talking at AHS, the Ancestral Health Symposium on salt and uh, giving a kind of contrarian view about um, the, the contrarian view against salt and, uh, or, or <laughs> yeah. So 
in the context of a ketogenic diet, and especially in a carnivore diet, or the evolutionary perspective, what are what are the real what real evidence do we have about salt needs and what affects those? Brilliant. Well, on a personal note, I've got so much respect for both of you, and I really thank you deeply for taking the time to talk on the record to each other uh, with me. Um, and you know, more power to you both. And uh, thanks for putting out so much cool stuff into the world. And um, look forward to you know seeing the reaction to to this episode thank you yeah it's been great i really appreciate both of you for having this much needed discussion oh yeah yeah thank you very much i appreciate it and you know i know people like pit amber and i against each other on twitter but we're basically we're, we're just kind of representing two ends of a very possible spectrum for most people and then optimal for each individual is going to be somewhere along there we're just like signposts of like two you know possible directions you can go and you know you just so uh, anytime there's opposing viewpoints the answer is always somewhere in between for most people and you just have to kind of figure out where that's at yeah i see it less of uh um, a versus and more of a yin and yang type of thing. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.